The law of excluded middle is the foundation of classical logic. But is it even true? What reasons do we have to accept it? According to intuitionistic logic, we shouldn't accept it at all. Let's find out why. everyone, welcome back to The Attic. We've got a slightly different setup, a slightly different look today. In this video, we're going to be talking about intuitionistic logic. This is a non-classical logic. It looks at classical logic, it looks at the law of excluded middle, and it says, no, we're not having that. Why do they say that? What is the motivation for intuitionistic logic going a different path? And what does it do to the logic when we take out the law of excluded middle? This is what we're going to be looking at today. So this is part of a whole series of videos introducing the basic concepts of logic. If you are finding it useful, enjoyable, why not subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to get the updates? So there's various different ways that we can approach intuitionistic logic. The way I'm going to do it is by starting off thinking about classical logic, this is the logic that we've been looking at up till now. Even though we've been looking at lots of different logics, propositional logic, first order logic, modal logic, quantified modal logic, these are all varieties of classical logic. So what do I mean by classical logic? Well, I guess there's two features that make logic classical. Firstly, each sentence is going to have a definite truth value, either true or false, but definitely not both. And negation is going to toggle us between true sentences and false sentences. OK, so you put those two things together and you've got classical logic. Now, that's not the only way of characterizing classical logic, but I think it's a nice, simple one. So as a consequence of that, we get the law of excluded middle. Every sentence A, it's either going to be true or false. So either it or its negation is going to be true. So the sentence A or not A will always be true, always valid. Whatever we mean by validity, true on all valuations, true in all models, true at all worlds in all models, whatever, this sentence will always be true for every sentence A. So a non-classical logic is really any way of breaking those classical principles. Loads of different ways to be a non-classical logic. We might change the way that the negation behaves. We might say that there are more true values, more true values than just true or false. We might say that sentences don't have to be either true or false. Or we might say that sentences can be both true or false. Intuitionistic logic is a kind of non-classical logic, and the way in which it is non-classical primarily is by rejecting the law of excluded middle. It doesn't always say for any sentence either it's true or false. Or more specifically, the excluded middle sentence, A or not A, isn't valid in intuitionistic logic. We can't always say for any sentence either A or not A, okay? It's not valid in intuitionistic logic. So in some ways, you can think of intuitionistic logic as being like classical logic, but with the law of excluded middle taken away. But it's not just that, because taking away excluded middle has other consequences throughout the logic. For example, in classical logic, we have double negation elimination, the move from not not A to A on its own. But that's not valid in intuitionistic logic, OK? So the move from not not A to A, that's not something you can do in intuitionistic logic. And there are other consequences. So when we're reasoning in classical logic, in classical natural deduction, say, we can use indirect proof. That is, if we want to prove some old sentence A, we can assume its negation, try to derive a contradiction from that assumption, and if we can do that, we can infer A. But you can't do that in intuitionistic logic. Indirect proof isn't a valid inference rule in intuitionistic logic. And you can kind of see how that ties in with double negation elimination. If we assume not A, and infer a contradiction, that's kind of like saying not A was false, not not A. In classical logic, we can go from not not A to A, so indirect proof gives us A as a conclusion, but 
in intuitionistic logic, we can't go from not not A to A. So that's kind of why indirect proof doesn't work. In our natural deduction system, these two proof rules, double negation, elimination, and indirect proof, they're equivalent. If we've got double negation, elimination, we can derive indirect proof. And if we've got indirect proof, we can derive double negation, elimination. So if we want rid of one of them, we need to get rid of both of them. And that's what intuitionistic logic does. We're going to go over intuitionistic natural deduction in more depth in another video. OK, so that is a bit on what intuitionistic logic isn't. But what is it? Like, what is the motivation behind intuitionistic logic? Why does it reject these principles? I think the basic idea is that intuitionistic logic involves constructive reasoning. OK, so what's constructive reasoning? Well, think about it like this. Suppose I make some existential statement. Something is F or there is an X such that dot, dot, dot. And you might go, OK, but which one? OK, what is the thing that is dot, dot, dot? What's the thing that's F? So, for instance, I might say that somebody got 90 percent in the test and you might go, OK, who? And it will be weird if I couldn't tell you, right? If I said, oh, you know, somebody got 90% in the test. I've, I've kind of marked them all. I've looked at all the answers. Yeah, somebody got 90%. But I wasn't able to tell you who, OK? Not because I'm not allowed to tell you, but just because I had no possible answer to that. I think that would just seem weird, right? If I don't know or if I'm not in a position to speak authoritatively on who got 90% in the test, then how on earth am I asserting that somebody did? That just seems slightly weird, according to intuitionists. So the case in which this often comes up in the literature is in mathematics. So if you're going to be proving there is a number such that dot, 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 you want to know which number it is. It's kind of weird to say, oh, yeah, there is this number, but not be in a position to say which number it is. I'm going to go over that in a little bit more detail in the video on constructive reasoning. There's another specific case in which this comes up, and this isn't to do with existentials. It's to do with disjunctions. So intuitionists think that if you're going to assert a disjunction, A or B, you should be in a position to say which one of those two is true. You shouldn't just be saying, oh, A or B, unless you can say it's either A that's true or B that's true. So being in a position to assert either A or B requires you to first be in a position to assert A or, on the other hand, being in a position to assert B. And this is kind of in some ways it's like the same point as the existential point because a disjunction is kind of an existential statement. It says out of these two things, A, B, one of them is true. At least one of them is true. There exists a true sentence here. Either it's A or it's B. So if we're requiring existential statements to have witnesses, that is, if we're going to be able to say exists something is true, we have to be able to say who it is, what it is. The same point basically carries through to disjunctions. If we're going to say one out of these two is true, A or B, we should be in a position to say which one it is. And you can see how you can get from this point about disjunctions to rejecting the law of excluded middle. Because in classical logic, we're always in a position to say A or not A. OK, for any sentence, whatever it is, even if it's something that we know nothing about, we can just say, well, either it's true or false, either A or not A. Even when we have absolutely no idea whether it's true or false. Intuitionists say, no, unless you're in a position to assert either A on the one hand or to assert not A on the other hand, you shouldn't be asserting A or not A. So that's why they reject the law of excluded middle. Here's a slightly different way to capture the problem that intuitionists have with classical logic. We can put it in terms of information. OK, so statements, sentences carry information about the world. And intuitionists think that we shouldn't be able to go from negative information, like something not being the case, to positive information, like something being the case. So as a particular instance of that, intuitionists will characterize a double negated sentence, not not A, as carrying negative information about the world. It's saying not A isn't true. 
But that's not the same as saying that A definitely is true, because that is positive information about the world, OK? A is true definitely characterizes how A is, whereas not not A, it's just saying that it's not the case that not A is false, OK? Just because you've ruled out something being false, according to intuitionists, doesn't capture the case where it is definitely true. It might be something that you just can't say anything about either way. So ruling out it being false, not not A, doesn't carry forward to positively asserting that it's true, A. That's why we can't go from not not A to A, double negation elimination, at least according to intuitionists. So one way of capturing this idea is to say you can't go from negative information, not not A, to positive information, A. And again, this ties in really closely with their rejection of the law of excluded middle, because if we did have the law of excluded middle, it's easy to see how we can go from not not A, the negative information, to A, the positive information. Because then we could go like this. If we start off from assuming not not A, and then we go, OK, well, using excluded middle, if we can do that, we can say either not A or A. It's got to be one or the other. But it can't be not A if we've also got not not A. That would be a contradiction. The only one of those options that I've got, A or not A, that's consistent with my assumption, not not A, is A. So if I have to pick one of them, A or not A, I've got to pick A. And that allows me to infer from not not A to A. So if I've got law of excluded middle, I can do double negation elimination. So if you're an intuitionist, on the basis of you don't like going from negative information, not not A, to positive information, A, so you don't like double negation elimination, you've also got to reject the law of excluded middle. So we're going to talk about the logical properties of intuitionism in future videos. We're going to talk about how it goes in natural deduction systems and what the logical semantics for it might look like. OK, so we're going to do that in the future. Let's just wrap this one up by talking a little bit about the links between intuitionistic logic and various different philosophical positions. So the first one I'm going to mention is anti-realism in contrast to realism about a particular thing. I'm going to be thinking here in particular about anti-realism about numbers. Intuitionistic logic is closely related to that kind of anti-realism about numbers. It says that the numbers do exist, but they're nothing above our ability to construct those numbers in thought, or it might be in a potential computation if you're coming from more of a kind of computer science background. Second philosophical view I'm going to briefly mention, verificationism. In the theory of meaning, saying that for a sentence to be meaningful, it has to be verifiable. Verificationism does nicely link in with intuitionistic logic for the reason that, you know, we're going to reject the law of excluded middle for those cases where we can't verify a sentence one way or another. There's another way of linking the ideas behind intuitionistic logic with philosophy of language, and this is the use theory of meaning. So this is associated with Wittgenstein in the philosophical investigations. And the idea here is that we don't associate the meaning of a word with its contribution to whether a sentence is true or false. Rather, we associate the meaning of a word with the way it's used, basically. And the link between that general theory of meaning for any old word and logic is the use of a word in logic is its proof rules. OK, guys, that is it for this super short introduction to intuitionistic logic and intuitionistic philosophy. We are going to be going into these topics in more detail in the videos that are coming up. So if you're interested in that, hit the subscribe button and get the updates. If you have questions about any of this stuff, leave me a comment below. Thank you so much for all the questions you've posted so far and thank you for your support. It means a lot to me. I will see you guys next time.